Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. And while our doors might be shut for the time being, we still want to provide you with an inside peek at the science and the people that make the museum what it is. We'd love to hear from you guys at home as well. So if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comments section and we'll come to as many as we can in the time we've got. Now, I know there are lots of very important conversations going right now about important social issues. That doesn't mean we should stop caring about our planet as well as the people around us. This week is a National Insect Week and all week we're celebrating the little things that run the world, playing really important roles in all sorts of ecosystems. Now, today we're going to be finding out about butterflies and what it's like to study them. To guide us on our way, we've got Blanca Huertas, who studies these beautiful animals at the museum. Hi, Blanca. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Kelly. Thank you. So before we get into the intro to you and, and your work and what you do, give us a, a little bit of an intro to uh, National Insect Week. Uh, well, insects are very important organisms, the little things that run the world. Uh, we, we don't uh, get to see them very often, so this is, this is a lovely opportunity to highlight the role of the insects in the planet. So this is an event organized by the Royal Entomological Society, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to run for the whole week, so we're going to talk about insects all week long. Because, you know, insects might be small and kind of overlooked a lot of the time, but there are so many uh, different types and they're so diverse and they play so many different roles, keeping ecosystems all over the world ticking over. I think, yeah, we could all appreciate that a little bit more. So your part of doing that is uh, working at the museum on our, in our butterfly collections. Why don't you give us uh, an introduction to what it's like doing your job? Well, it's a fantastic job for a butterfly person. It's a dream job to be accompanied by 5 million specimens in this fantastic facility, uh, state-of-the-art facility, that big building, the Darwin Center at the Natural History Museum has like a cocoon shape. Uh, and that's my role is to protect, uh, to keep those collections, which has been uh, for more than 150 years in the museum. It's a national treasure uh, to keep it run it, updated, uh, to keep uh, people uh, given accessibility to this uh, to these thousands and thousands of boxes we have full of butterflies for study. Um, so, uh, it and, and you, don't just, you, don't, you don't just work in the collections with our thousands and thousands of specimens, but you also get to go on some pretty cool expeditions as well, don't you? Yeah, so we only, not only working on the collections, as I said, with lots of colleagues, uh, but also in different uh, in different places in the world. I got the opportunity to go and, and do some nice trips abroad. Uh, but it's fascinating because you find new things either in the field or in the collections. Uh, but one of the most important and rewarding things that we do at the Natural History Museum and us like scientists is to get interaction with the public, uh, with people interested, really truly interested in nature, or like all of you listening today. Uh, and I, I like to do public talks also, displays of, uh, sort of displays. And I'll, apart from those technical uh, papers, I like to write uh, popular science books. So knowledge on butterflies can be for anyone who is interested. I mean, I can totally identify with the, uh, with the joy that comes with sharing your passion for nature and science with other people. I mean, that's why I'm here. That's why you're here. And hopefully that's why all our viewers are here. So, yeah, you see in this, this picture, for example, you see some of the volunteers who have come since the school age to help in the collections and now they becoming wonderful entomologists working on butterflies. It's amazing. That you, it must be so nice to see that kind of progression from, uh, you know, so, someone who's at school age, but they're really interested and in seeing the expertise and understanding and passion grow until studying insects with you. It's important the collections because it's like a mini school for inspiring people to have the specimens we are not able to see everywhere because not everybody has the opportunity to travel around the world. So we got a, a good representation for across the globe, across history and across in time. So uh, to start us off, let's get a, let's look at uh, the butterflies themselves. Um, we've had a few questions from our viewers, um, including from Ash, I think, uh, wondering how many species of butterflies are there out there? Well, there is quite a lot of butterflies, believe it or not. Uh, there is about 20,000 
uh, named species. Uh, we got a tiny fraction here in the United Kingdom. We only have the 60 species flying in the country. Uh, but around the world, there are another 19,000 uh, in, in the whole world. So whereabouts can we find these? If, if you can only find 60 here in the UK and there are another 19,940 <laughs> plus ones that we haven't discovered, where are they? Well, apart from the lovely things that you can actually encourage to come to your gardens, to your windowsill, and to see them just, to, just to, around the corner of your house in the park, uh, butterflies are very well attracted to areas uh, where there is a good, uh, where there are good plants to eat and where there is good sun to have. Uh, so uh, naturally butterflies occur in really, really well uh, um, protected forests. That's what is important to, to protect the forest. And we can find them everywhere in the world. No, not in the Antarctica, that's the only place we haven't found it, but even so in the really, really high mountains uh, in the tropics or even in Asia. Uh, Why don't we find them in Antarctica? Well, because there's not enough sun, I'm afraid, and there is no plants neither. So, as I said, the two major requirements for butterflies to be in is have good source of food, and we're going to see why, and good source of sun also when they are adults. Sunbathing and food. I mean, who could ask for any better than that? All of us love it. <laughs> so, around the world, you said that you don't find them in Antarctica, but you find them every other continent. I think we've got a map of, uh, of some of the, the most diverse areas. Why don't you talk yeah. us through? I love this map because it's a, it's a map done by Conservation International about the biodiversity hotspots. So if you see that red line pass uh, by the equator, so it's with, with the areas of the world where, where the sun is constantly there and uh, there is no mark, mark, very marked seasons. So again, it's a lot of, it's a good source of, of sun for all of the plants and for all of the butterflies. And those red spots that you see on the, on the map and the, and the orange ones are um, those uh, biodiversity areas where th there is a lot of diversity. And uh, most of the species are concentrated on those regions in the world. I guess, you know, if you've got lots of sunlight feeding lots of plants and the, the, uh, the climate is relatively stable, like you were saying, they don't have big seasonal changes. That allows a lot of life to, to have a bit of an easier time in, in, in developing and evolving and growing. So it's no surprise you'll have more, more butterflies there. But when, what's it like for a human going to these, uh, these amazing biodiversity hotspots? I mean, it must be beautiful, but I assume some of them aren't the easiest to get to. Uh, well, I wish I would be a butterfly with wings and can go anywhere without <laughs> passing by passport control. Uh, so. <laughs> So uh, we have to we have to use wings also somehow as helicopters because some of the areas are not accessible and the areas with the most interesting species or the ones that are unknown to us to scientists and to humans are in really remote areas where there are no roads or the roads are so bad that you have to ask one of those guys with the with the jeeps to take you and in some cases we have to use mules to go there and uh, and explore those fascinating areas. So, you know, you're, you're going out there to discover new species and to do cutting edge science, but you're, you're riding horses. That's, you know, it's such an old technology to use. Well, I wish, I wish the horses, I, I will be riding the horses because the horses usually are for carrying equipments because we need a certain amount of equipment. We need campsites and we need uh, tents. Uh, lots of food to bring to the forest because you don't get uh, many resources. Even water you have to bring most of the times. So you're just walking alongside through the through the forest. <sighs> whatever is necessary, 10, 12 hours, whatever you need to do it. Uh, and you arrive to these amazing places in the middle of nowhere where there is no electricity, there is no communications, no emails, no telephone ringing. And, oh, that uh, sounds so you, amazing. So you actually disconnect from the world. Uh, but sometimes, uh, probably the downside is sometimes, well, for some people might be an advantage of not having a shower for days. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've had the, the good fortune to spend a few days in the jungle before as well, and I found the, the lack of phone notifications to be a really, really liberating thing. Uh, <laughs> but then also it must, you know, it must be quite, uh, quite tough, but also quite fun living in these jungle camps. It is. You, the only thing, as I say, you get quite stinky and uh, the, the insects get to gets to bite you. So that's the beauty of butterfly. The butterflies are not going to sting 
and they're not going to bother you if you're smelly. There's just all little wasps and other insects <laughs> who came to feed on you. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's not like studying mosquitoes or something. You probably end up with quite a few bites there. <laughs> Uh, so we've had a couple of questions, uh, more questions from our, from our viewers. Sure. Um, talking about uh, how having a good food source is really important to uh, to butterflies. Um, what sort of but plants do butterflies like best? Uh, well, uh, uh, Rihanna. Yeah, depends depends of uh, of which area of the world you are. Uh, and remember, uh, butterflies they have different life stages. So when they caterpillars, they only feed, they're very fussy, they only feed in certain kind of plants. So when they when the mother lays an egg, a butterfly lays an egg on a plant, she's ensuring that is the right plant where the caterpillar, when they hatch from the egg, is going to be eating. eating uh, okay. Yeah, so the little babies are the fussy ones, as we all know. All mothers <laughs> will know that. <laughs> and uh, the adults are much more relaxed, they're more generalistic, generalized uh, organisms. So they like to feed on different kind of flowers. So so that's the, that's what they feed on. Okay, well I think we'll I think we'll come to a bit more detail in their on their life cycle in a little bit. But first of all, um, let, let's go back to, to how you study them in the field. So you've been traveling through the forest with mules, sometimes jeeps, sometimes helicopters, and staying in these little camps. But when you're actually there, how do you study and collect these specimens? Well, surprisingly, we are still studying butterflies as people do it 150 years or more ago. Uh, this is a beautiful photo of Margaret Fenton, one of the first female butterfly collectors and she has the same style of net that we still are using 100 years after but a slightly different outfit thank goodness <laughs> we don't have to wear the <laughs> same I mean, dress that hat looks great but maybe not super practical so here's you doing exactly the same thing with exactly the same sort of net right but the different clothes <laughs> yeah, you've got a, a lovely like waterproof top and a machete what's the machete for Ah, well, you need to clear out a little bit of the paths uh, when you're working for butterflies because they like to, when they fly, they kind of uh, land, uh, glide across the bushes. And when you drop your net, the net can get caught if there are uh, spiky plants or something like that. But not all of the butterflies do that. You're not so lucky the butterflies just go come to you. Most of the butterflies are super high flyers and in the really, really peak sunny days, sunny times during the day, they are really, really fast. So you need to be really fast with the net. And those who never come around, like the females, for example, I don't know if you knew this, but most of the females kept the low profile. They kept really, really high on the canopy. So they know very often seen. So we need that specialized net that you see on the right side of the, of the yeah, photo. Yeah, that's really, how long is that? That's about, it, it can reach up to four meters. Uh, it's a bit wobbly when you, when, if it's windy, but when you are in the forest, it's quite shelter uh, and you actually get to reach really, really high areas that you won't be able to see the butterflies. Well, you know, I, I understand why the butterflies might, you know, hang out a bit higher up if there's people chasing them with nets at, uh, at ground level. And it's not just people, I guess, it's all sorts of, uh, all sorts of other organisms that would love to have a snack of a butterfly. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Um, so, I think there's a, this is a good point to, to address a, some questions that we've been getting from, from sure. our, um, about moths and butterflies, because you study butterflies, but there are a lot of things that they have in common with moths, um, but they're different in some ways, uh, but maybe it's not super clear. Would you mind clarifying that a little bit? What are the things they have in common? Sure, this is, well, in... Technically, it's just uh, for us to understand groups of organisms, but butterflies phylogenetically, so it means in the relations they have with ancestors and other organisms like moths, they are super closely related. Related, And actually, my colleagues, my moth colleagues uh, will be very happy to, to hear this, but butterflies technically are moths, uh, part of the, of the tree of the Lepidoptera, which is a group of who, who actually put together moths and butterflies and you will be surprised what the, we all believe most people believe butterflies are colorful and fly during the day are they pretty but if you see this picture is a stunning picture of just moths 
for the surprise of all of you. There None of these no about the flies. None of them. And all of those can be really, really colorful. And as I said, uh, um, a, the, di we, the diversity of moths is huge and they are more primitive than the butterflies. They got 140,000 species uh, around the world. Uh, so in theory, by every species of butterfly, you find seven species of moths. So they are super diverse. So moths can be anything, basically. Butterflies are a little bit a little bit more different and they don't have the capacity to fly during the day which is a it's a good uh, it's a good characteristic but again during the day you can find one of those beautiful butterflies flying around you hey moths and, and yeah so how can how can we tell the difference if we see something fluttering past us on a summer day how do we know whether it's a moth or a butterfly well you can have a look of certain structures which are uh, uh, can help but again the difference are very very subtle uh, you can have a look of the antenna. The butterflies always, in general, apart from the skippers, uh, they got a clubbed antenna. As you see so it's like a, a thin antenna with a little blob on the end. When a little blob, yeah. And the bodies are generally skin, and they're not so feathered, so so fluffy like the like the some of the moths. And they they usually colorful. But if you see one of the pictures in the next picture, uh, we're gonna see that our butterflies we look can be very dull. Also, those little brown ones. Uh, people might get confused, they moths, but yeah, again, the diversity is so huge. If you think about 20,000 kind of butterflies, obviously we're not going to find a kind of a pattern to, to differentiate them. But uh, generally, as I said, the antenna is a really good indicator and some other structures like uh, some um, under the wings, there are some structures in the moths, which are very distinctive, more primitive uh, than in the butterflies. But that, that, that's not seen with the human naked eye. So we just we can just call it lovely Lepidoptera. <laughs> so Lepidoptera, and, th and that's the name for the group of moths and butterflies together, right? Um, yeah. And what does that mean? Uh, well, you can break the you can break the name down into different chunks. Sure. Right? Yeah, Lepis means uh, scales, and Tera or Terum means the wings. So any of uh, the insects with scales on the wings, over the wings, are Lepidopterans. So that includes the moths and the butterflies. And uh, I think so we've we got an image of some of these scales. Yeah, um, we got a lovely picture. Show, show the viewers. Yeah, it, that's a it's scanning, uh, it's scanning the microscope. So uh, it's, it's an electron microscope. So it uses yeah. instead of a beam of light and and the lenses like a like a magnifying glass. It instead yeah. of it uses a beam of electrons to get really clear pictures of really tiny tiny things, much smaller than a light microscope can see. Yeah, that's correct, because that has to be increased thousands and thousands of times. They are called nanostructures because they're tiny. Uh, so if you see now, this is, that's the detail of uh, one of the scales in, in, in a butterfly, because we've been doing some studies on this. Uh, but th those scales uh, are very interesting structures because inside, even if you go even in more detail on all those SEM uh, microscopes, uh, you get more detail. They got tiny, tiny tubes, lots of interesting structures. So we're going to see later why they people is now studying those structures to to help uh, to develop things for humans. And um, we've got a viewer, Micah, is asking, uh, why are they different colors? Uh, so different moths, different butterflies. You see different patterns and different types of color. Why? Why are these different colors? Uh, well, patterns are uh, a result of evolutionary processes, uh, but the color is a result of the way that the, those tiny scales are put on top of the wings. So when you, for example, if you see on, on roof, you see some tiles nicely placed in really colonial towns, for example, you see them, they got the very nice layouts. The wings can be uh, place in different angles so they reflect the light in different ang angles too and some of those scales are being developed some of those uh, scales uh, get actually in pigments but some of them don't have pigments so they reflect the light in different ways so that's how we get to see all of these different patterns and butterflies and i will say the 20,000 species is not only the, the number of butterflies forms that you have remember butterflies can be dimorphic so that means the female is distinctive of the of the male. So you got lots of so if you multiplied the number of species which are different males and females, you got more and more and more forms of the butterflies. 
Okay, and we've got one last question before we move on to some uh, some more of the content of the talk. And um, we've had a few people asking about um, collecting specimens and uh, whether whether you kill the butterflies that you collect and 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 why. Well, the collections uh, in the Natural History Museum, the large collection has not been amalgamated in a couple of days. They've been amalgamated for over 150 years and much more. Uh, so they keep a sample. It's important uh, for the museums, not for people, for the museum's collections to keep samples and uh, representations uh, of specimens from around the world. Uh, we scientists, we, uh, that's what is so important for when people go and, and photograph specimens for us because we get data without killing a specimen. So it's important the work the scientists and the museum we're doing writing books because you can actually identify the specimen without taking it out from the field. So you don't need to collect every time that you go to the field, you, you don't need to go and kill everything because that's not the reason. Uh, it's only you need to get a sample if you don't know what is this. So if you if you think it's a new species, you you might need to take it to to the to the lab and to study carefully that specimen. But it's uh, uh, Victorian collectors have collected already, and this is the stage of the world that we need to reduce that impact that humans are doing in nature and be more more using technology, for example, photos to identify or photography or things like that. So it's great to hear that you know. Uh, nowadays, we don't need to go around just kind of grabbing everything we see. We can be a lot more uh, careful and considerate in, in how we gather data um, from, from studying these animals. Well, it's we important because if, if we, sorry, because if we didn't have mm -hmm. a sample of some of the specimens we're going to see today, uh, we didn't know they were extinct. We never seen in nature, but they were, uh, there is a sample. And don't forget, butterflies uh, reproduces massively. If you think you have millions of ants in your garden, millions of little little uh, black flies eating your plants, butterflies reproduce exactly in the same rate. They have thousands of babies over the life cycle in some species. So they are uh, they are uh, the impact when a scientist goes to the field is minimal. But again, if someone is go is going irresponsibly to go and collect everything they found, obviously that is an impact. But otherwise, it's not. How long do you say uh, that some of them can produce thousands of eggs over their lifetime? How long is a butterfly's lifetime usually? Well, having such a diversity, uh, the life cycle is very diverse also. Uh, it, the different stages vary incredibly. You got even specimens who spend months on the ground as pupas, uh, as, as cocoons, sorry, on, in the case of moths, for example, even years. Uh, some of the butterflies, can, as all of the moths can live for a, for a day, uh, but butterflies in average, they live about uh, two weeks. That's kind of an average, but some butterflies have been recorded to be alive for over six months, some of the ones which are actually in migration. And that's uh, in, their, in their adults phase. So they've been, uh, they've been alive before that as, as caterpillars and, and eggs, right? Yeah. So again, every species has a very particular life cycle. And surprisingly, you won't believe this. Uh, we know all of these 20,000 species of butterflies, but we don't know the life cycle. We don't know how they look differently in most of the species. Most of the life cycles have not been studied. It's another completely world. And I will probably need another lifetime to be a specialist in life cycles of different well, I guess, species. Well, I guess if, you, you know, if you're out in the field, and you catch a butterfly and you catch uh, a caterpillar, how do you know if they are the same species without seeing the caterpillar, you know, eventually turn into a cocoon and then eventually emerge as an adult? Correct. That's that's what is important in museum collections and the, the, the data that you get out of museum collections as books. So you will be able to see, to match which caterpillar match the actual adult because these people who has rare those caterpillars until the adult stage, and they have recorded this. But again, we, we know little about immature stages on butterflies, let alone moths. Moths, technically, three out of four moths are new species for science. And it's because we found lots of caterpillars that we got no idea in the tropics. So it's, a, so it's a something that all of you who are listening today could be interested in working on immature stages. We need more scientists working on this. You heard it here first. Go do a PhD in lepidoptery. <laughs> Super. <laughs> um, but that—that's actually a really important point, though. I think 
you know, we may think that we, you know, we we as humans know a lot about the natural world, but actually, there's always more to discover. And whether you are just, you know, exploring out in the out in the world just as, as a as, as a as a non scientist, or whether you go into a career in science, there's always more to discover. And, and and every bit of discovery always adds to the bigger the body of knowledge that that we have as as a race. Um, but also, as we were talking about um, butterflies lifespans and, and stuff like that, obviously one thing that could cut a butterfly's life short is being a meal for another organism. Um, what sorts of things eat caterpillars? I mean, eat caterpillars and butterflies and moths and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, butterflies are an important, an important organism in the food chain. We don't believe this, but if butterfly disappears, we might lose a big chunk of the birds, a big chunk of the spiders, because uh, all of those organisms, also bats, uh, lizards, they all feed on, on butterflies in different stages. Uh, the caterpillars are quite yummy because they're not so strong like uh, like the butterflies, but still some organisms feed on the bodies of the butterflies and you, uh, so they are super important on uh, for, for that reason. So here we have um, a beautiful praying mantis, which is uh, just a bit of an encounter with a butterfly. That butterfly doesn't look like it's in the best place. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the mantis that's an is having a really spot. important meal. I know, that's, that's the poor thing. <laughs> but still you don't believe it, but we still do, analysis when we found wings dropped in the in the in the forest we still can identify because most of the identifications of butterflies are actually uh, on the patterns of the wings most of them uh, most of the species about the well the common species well phyllis uh, one of our viewers has been asking uh, about the markings on the wings and uh she's asking whether the the kind of the, the sort of spots on the wings uh, are they because she heard that they were meant to be eyes to scare away predators? Is that true, or what roles do these patterns? Um, how it works, evolution is not uh, something appears because of this. It's something appears and it was successful. So one of those patterns might scare predators because they think they think it's like big eyes or, for example, bright bright colors. Uh, also is pattern that uh, is stayed in evolution because they were chosen by the females. So they continue across evolution uh, to reproduce. So, so yeah, so those, those ringlets has a function in nature and, and, and that one is, uh, is, is it, it can be as, it can be as a scary predators. Yeah, in some of the species, but very few species do that. Uh, but m butterflies are clever. They use other mechanisms like camouflage so they can actually have the wings in the color of the environment. And some of those are also mimetic. So that what they're doing is copying all the butterflies, which are actually poisonous. So butterflies are lots and lots of have been successful evolutionarily speaking in years and years of evolution to develop developing all of these mechanisms to make them safe. Well, you know, when you are small and delicate like a butterfly, and there's a whole world of things that would love to eat you, like birds and mantises and lizards and all the things you were talking about. I guess you've got to have some methods of keeping yourself safe. And um, success. <laughs> and success, don't forget. <laughs> yes, because if, you've, if got, you're, you've got to stay safe and reproduce. And reproduce, yeah, because if you're safe and you die, uh, <clears> that's <throat> it. <laughs> that's it. That's not a continuation of the species. So we've talked about their role in ecosystems as food for other things and stuff, but uh, also some of them are, are helpful to the plants as well. They don't just feed off the plants, but that they some some of them pollinate flowers, right? Yeah, butterflies are not the most popular pollinators, but they do pollinate uh, those beautiful butterflies like this one, a postman from uh, from South America, from Central and South America, Heliconius uh, butterfly. Uh, they go they call postman because they go from flower to flower. So when they when they feed in on the nectar of the flowers, uh, they accidentally can uh, retrieve pollen from the flowers and take it to another ones. The, the complexity of the pollination is, is better on, on of, of the accuracy of the pollination is better on, on, on bees because they have developed specialized structures on the legs and so on. But uh, still butterflies can be, can be good pollinating and we've got very good species doing that role. And as well as their intrinsic value to ecosystems, 
humans have appreciated butterflies on a kind of aesthetic level, on a visual and cultural level for a long time. Yes, uh, butterflies, because of this sheer beauty and the diversity that we just talked about, uh, there is an explosion of uh, artifacts or imagery around not only in, in culture, but also in art, as you see, in jewelry, in clothing. Uh, lots of patterns of butterflies have been used for, for the human entertainment, uh, but also uh, it, they are, they, we've been appreciating butterflies for thousands of years. We don't believe this, but the first, one of the first observations of carvings of, of butterfly drawings are about 6,000 years. Uh, that was found in a cave in Turkey. And we, we got uh, drawings of butterflies, even in this uh, lovely rock I brought from Peru a couple of years ago after field work. Uh, the the uh, Incas also has a, a, a good appreciation of butterflies that we're talking about in the 1400s. So butterflies have been around our culture, but uh, also don't forget the appreciation of butterflies because they are a sign of spring. When we see butterflies flying around, we think it's a spring. And when we feel butterflies in the tummy, it's because we are in love. So the appreciation of butterflies is not only on, on these artifacts we have in here in art, for example, uh, but also in paintings and in literature, in poems and books. There is plenty of uh, uh, examples of the role of these beautiful uh, organisms. I, I really love hearing these stories of how human culture and the natural world have, have interacted over the years and the centuries and the millennia. But coming forward to, to the present day and, and to, to your work, um, how do the museum collections and, and your expeditions help to advance our knowledge of these beautiful organisms and, and how does that, what, what benefits can we gain from that? Well, that's an excellent question because people might not think, people might think the museums are just uh, places with something behind a glass. But we have some, we have the specimens in the collection. But you don't think all of those books, all of those books I got in my background, my butterfly books have been done with the museum collections. The specimens have been photographed because we need to see the whole, the whole uh, extent of the of the wing patterns to be able to identify. Uh, I mentioned before species, for example, extinct in England, like the like the large blue Fengaris arion, that was extinct in the 1970s, 1979, and and we know where it was that butterfly flying. And because of the information in the museum collections, we were able to track where we will be able to reintroduce this butterfly. And successfully, that was reintroduced about 20 years ago. And we have, again, that butterfly who was lost because of the uh, loss of forests in England. Uh, but now, again, all of the information from the museums help to, to learn where the butterfly was, where the, the work should be done. And I got another example. This is the Queen Alexandra butterfly, which is the biggest butterfly in the world, but it's also the most endangered butterfly in the world. And again, the museum collections uh, have been really, really useful uh, for, again, for locating, for doing uh, mapping of the distribution of this species and be able to do plants uh, because this butterfly is badly affected by the plantations of uh, in, in Asia. It's an endemic of Papua New Guinea. So we know all of this information that only flies in this country, that feeds on this plant. All of that information came from the museum collections. And that's important for, for all of us to know. And I think it's great that we can use uh, the information we have about these species, like the, the blue butterfly on the left from the UK and the Queen Alexandra, Alexandra on the right um, from, from Southeast Asia. We can use the information we have about these species to then protect whole ecosystems. We can use it to you know, uh, advocate for reforesting parts of the UK and for, for uh, protecting rainforest from palm oil expansion. So well, that's correct, that's correct. Yeah, so, the, so for example, the Queen Alexandra is being used as an umbrella species. It means an umbrella species is you choose a species which is loved by the public, by the government, by people. So they actually want to invest and protect it. And, at the same time that you're protecting the habitat of that particular species, you're protecting the whole habitat for so many other species, for the ugly mosquito, for the brown beetle. But again, the beauty of the butterfly has to be taken uh, as an opportunity to uh, maintain conservation or to promote conservation and aw raising awareness. We, we are interested in butterflies because they're very showy, very pretty, public really like it. 
and uh, it, it that's, that's a very good reason to to take advantage of that. On the subject of um, appealing species that that hold a, a, a place in people's hearts, um, we've had uh, Chloe and Akemi as well, uh, viewers of ours, who are asking, "What's your favourite butterfly?" Goodness, that is a very tricky question. I always get that <laughs> question. Uh, I just feel like the principal, when people ask, what's your favorite pupil in the whole school? Well, don't forget in my whole school, I got five million specimens. They're all pretty. They all have incredible stories attached in the museum we keep. In every specimen, there is a little piece of information attached to this specimen. So if you think about in a sample of pretty colorful <laughs> butterflies, I'm also like to say I like uh, particularly that little brown spot that you see. There's one of the butterfly. Uh, who was collected uh, by myself in 2005, so not too far out, well, some, time, some years ago. The one ago. in the centre. Yeah, the one in the centre is a brown little butterfly that has not been before, nobody put a name on, so actually it was a new species, and it was actually my first discovered species. And um, that highlights that not only the pretty butterflies are interesting, and the pretty, but pretty butterflies have been studied by many, many people, but the little brown jobs still has a lot of potential for many of us. And I've been working with these butterflies for 15 years. So this is kind of my area of speciality, those those brownie butterflies. But between us, I love the morpho, the morpho, the blue morpho in the corner is, is one of the most stunning specimens, but all of them, you can, you can argue they're pretty and they're stunning. I really love the uh, yeah the, the arrangements of spots on that little brown one, and I think that's you know it's a it's a reminder that beauty is subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. You know, a lot of people might like the big colourful ones with the big trails on their wings, but there is a, there's also beauty in the the little little plainer ones. Um, so going back into your into your, your research, so the more we know about butterflies, the more we can conserve bits of the environment, but we also uh, gain a lot more sorts of information from them. Uh, our understanding of their wings, for example, can lead to all sorts of cool bio-inspired research. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, uh, not, not far ago, about 10 years ago, there was a kind of explosion of a new discipline called the biomimetics. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Parker at the Natural History Museum, uh, he was studying these beautiful morphos, uh, not just because they're pretty, but because of the property of the wing scales we were mentioning before. So uh, they, he was studying the pigmentation because uh, thanks to this uh, biomimetics technology uh, on the wings, you can actually develop uh, a specialized product for humans, for example, like more um, paint that will last longer because those butterflies don't, because of the reflection of the light, they actually don't get to fade. Uh, when you use pigments, they, things fade. So that's kind of a prospective research. And uh, even so, uh, painting in cars is being developed also because of the of the properties of the wings of butterflies. Not only butterflies, but also let's give some credits to the beetles. And uh, it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, technology coming through this new discipline of biomimetics, which is growing exponentially. There's a lot of people going on this, and a lot of funding and research going in that topic. So we can. You know, we can use butterfly research to protect bits of the environment. We can use them to develop new products. Um, but how do we go about discovering and naming new species as well? Because you've discovered a fair few yourself. How many have you named? Uh, Carenza, one of our one of our viewers, would like to know that. Oh my goodness, I forgot how many. <laughs> They're not too many. Probably nine or something like that. Uh, yeah, always the first one is a special, isn't it? Uh, yeah, as I say, I've been working on all of these brown species. It's important to, to discover the species because some of the species have been discovered as new species with colleagues, uh, working with colleagues from around the world. They are on the edge of extinction. So if we haven't found that butterfly to be a new species, we will probably will never knew it was a new species because it's no longer flying. We got a couple of examples on the on the next photography. One of the species. How do you tell the difference between two very similar looking look at whether it's a new species or whether it's just a weird looking individual from the old species? Well, the description of butterflies is not as easy as it, is, as it looks like. It takes uh, probably sometimes even a year or more uh, to be able to uh, compare with museums. Again, we use collections in the museums because. Uh, we need to, if whatever you found strange in the field, you need to match 
the, those patterns and having a couple of specimens with, with those little ring, ringlets, uh, for example, with the little circles, you know, if, if it's a constant character, if it's something that is always in the butterfly, so you know is it different or not. So it's like, for example, as with the freckles, some people have freckles, some people don't have freckles, but we know because we have seen photos of people with freckles and without freckles. So we have in the Natural Museum, we have lots of, and in other collections, lots of different uh, specimens from the same species to see that variation among species. So then you don't get foolish to name new species because it has an extra dot or something like that. So this is a, a group of butterflies I like most, as I said before, the, the ringlets, the satirids, they brown, but they're super interesting with intricate patterns on the back of the wings. What you're seeing is the back of the butterfly uh, but surprisingly enough, we found a new species, a uh, new subspecies of, of the size of a butterfly for the size of a hand, but only looking in the museum collection. We didn't collect that in the field. We actually, that huge butterfly is on, is on one of the guys uh, at the museum hands, is, is actually from the museum collections. And we're developing new research. We're doing artificial intelligence on all of these uh, postman butterflies, trying to make machines to learn how the color has evolved and how we, we can we can tell apart uh, uh, the stories of butterflies if, if you want to hear So uh, is that what we're looking at on the right of this image here? What's that, uh, what are all those colored numbers and, and, and those images? Uh, yeah, as I say, it's, it's quite a complex uh, work we, we did recently uh, with uh, some colleagues in the Cambridge University. So, so yeah, so we're doing, as I say, we're training machines how to read patterns of colors of colors and study evolution of butterflies but again we need lots of samples we need to photo photograph specimens and and teach and train the machine how to distinguish those those features among the butterflies so you've got an artificial an artificial intelligence sorry too early for that <laughs> um, you've got an artificial intelligence uh, helping you to identify wing patterns and new species and stuff take some of the Take some of the hard work out of it. Uh, we we study more rather than new species. I wish it would be with machines. I hope uh, that's a work that we're doing actually uh, with this large butterfly. We're working on UV reflection. That's another work we're doing at the moment with other colleagues from the Czech Republic, uh, because we don't see nature as butterflies do. So they can perceive colors in a different way. They got more specialized eyes and they got thousands of eyes in one single eye. So they see colors in a different way. So we now doing photography with several filters, with several uh, programs on the cameras and the machine and the computers. So we can actually analyze all of these patterns that we, we cannot see on the naked eye. Fascinating. So uh, I think now's a good, another good time to uh, go to some more questions from our viewers because we're getting towards the end of our, our allocated time here. So let's, let's try and get some interaction. Um, so Peter has asked if you have any tips for any budding lepidopterists, so any people who'd like to study moths and butterflies, right. um, because his 11-year-old son uh, would like to eventually do a PhD on moths. Super. <laughs> so I think your PhD topic at the age of 11, that's planning. I didn't know what I wanted to do for my PhD until I was already doing it. <laughs> so um, why, why, don't you, why don't you give Peter, Peter and his son yeah. a bit of advice? Well, I, I, I've been studying butterflies since I was about 12, which is not too far from, from Peter. Uh, and, uh, and the most important thing is to go and explore nature, look in detail. Uh, for me, um, the when we study, when we're trying to encourage butterflies to come to our houses, planting nice gardens, we also help in conservation, but we are actually learning because we we observing behavior, we observing patterns in the wild because it's not the same to see a book of butterfly than see a butterfly flying and continue continue working. And I will say that I will take this opportunity. We come to the Natural History Museum, uh, be a volunteer, engage with nature, come and help in the collections because it's a five million collections and everybody's welcome to, to come and help at the time, probably when he grows a little bit bigger. <laughs> and I guess come when, after a when, when the museum is open again. <laughs> and when we are opening again, <laughs> because we, we're broadcasting from home today, <laughs> hopefully soon. Well, thank you. Um, there have been a couple of questions about some of the 
exceptions to some of the rules that we've been talking about when we're talking about butterflies. Um, so uh, Lena has asked, are there butterflies that have a diet that uh, is different from, from flowers or something? Are there any that eat meat? Oh my goodness, I missed that. Yes, uh, when I was, uh, sorry, when I was mentioning about the nets, we also use uh, uh, traps, yeah? The traps are baited. We use baits because some butterflies, uh, despite they're super fast flyers or they high in the canopy, they cannot resist to the smells and the flavors on certain kind of fruits that we probably don't want to eat as humans. So rotten fish, rotten fruits in the forest, uh, for example, even dung, uh, so from mammals, uh, some butterflies cannot resist that smell, so they go to the traps. But uh, the reason why uh, the butterflies actually go and eat on those uh, strong flavored, uh, strong flavors is because they contain a lot of minerals, and those minerals are super important for the males to be able to reproduce. So they need to get all of those salts in the body to be able to process and, and uh, be successful evolutionary as it's reproducing. Well, rotting fruit, rotten fish, and dung. If we're trying to lure a human into a trap, I think, <laughs> for me, you'd probably have to use a different set of baits, but whatever works for butterflies. Um, <laughs> and you get the most fascinating ones, believe me. <laughs> things, things that you never see on the forest, they just come to you. They're just interesting butterflies with niche tastes. Um, <laughs> is asking, are there any butterflies that uh, aren't beneficial to the ecosystem that they live in? Uh, well, as we said, uh, yeah, the butterflies, again, are food for all the organisms. That's kind of the biggest benefit of the butterflies on the planet. Uh, and again, they are bioindicators. So when, for example, if you are studying an area and you, you see the immature stages, even in the immature stages or the adult stages, if you see the presence or absence of a butterfly, a particular butterfly who only lives in that kind of forest, you can use that information to be... Uh, to use and say this forest is changing. So that's why we call it bioindicators uh, or, or, or indicators of the quality of the environment. So just what single organism can perceive a, a poisonous river or polluted air, those organisms move away or they disappear from the area. So you know, you know they can be helpful for that. Um, so I think we've got time for one last question before we wrap up. And there have been quite a few people asking what, what's the biggest and smallest butterflies that exist? So I think you mentioned the Queen Anne. Yeah, we love to. <laughs> um, and did you say that the Queen Alexandra was the biggest? The one that we were looking Yes, that's right. Yeah, the Queen Alexandra is the biggest, uh, the Queen Alexandra, Alexander Berwing, uh, is uh, the biggest butterfly in the world. It can have up uh, to 28 centimeters on the wingspan. So it's, it's as big, I got really that's big hands and you, will, big. you can yeah. see it's a big thing. Uh, and it fly, it's an endemic butterfly of the forest of Papua New Guinea. And as I said, because not just because it's big or precious, it's in its particular habitat, so the habitat has been unfortunately disturbed in Papua New Guinea, where is this uh, butterfly. And the smallest one is uh, recorded. Or, uh, there is always, um, we got tiny ones in South America, where I come from, uh, but also they, they name it uh, smallest with 12 millimeters uh, uh, size. Is, is called the, um, the Pygmy Blue, uh, it, and it flies in America, North America. So it's a tiny, tiny little thing. But if you ask me about moths, moths can be really, really big. So the Atlas moth is the biggest moth, uh, in wingspan also. And we got this tiny, tiny uh, micro moth in England, in the gardens. You might think, so please, next time when you go to your garden, there might not be a mosquito, but there might be a little moth flying in your garden because the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest thing in the world of on the Lepidoptera is actually a moth who flies in the gardens in England. So I think that's a lovely way to, lovely place to wrap it up. <clears throat> We've got these things that can range from the tiniest little things to something that's bigger than your face. And they live all over the world and they're so important for keeping ecosystems going and for uh, developing the frontiers of science. <clears throat> But also, they're just absolutely beautiful, and we have humans have quite a, a long relationship with them. So, I, Blanca, I think you've given us lots of reasons to to love and protect butterflies and the place. Super! <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank you very much. Next time. Thanks for listening. Bye, Blanca.
So thank you so much for joining us at home today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please do join us again uh, for more Nature Live shows at 12 on Tuesdays and at 10.30 in the morning on Fridays. We'll be celebrating National Insect Week all of this week. So this Friday show will be Alison talking to Max Barkley about beetles and they are fascinating. Keep an eye on our social media channels as well. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, as well as nhm.ac.uk. Until next time, that was Blanca Huertas. I'm Khalil Thurloway, and this has been Nature Live. Thank you and goodbye.